Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you once again uh, now in this evening time for your goodness and mercy, your loving kindness, uh, the blessings of a full and complete salvation that we enjoy day by day through your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we come to you this evening with thankful hearts and seeking that you would bless our time together as we would discuss this very important subject of Christian higher education. We pray that you would give insight and clarity and help us to understand um, as we assess and learn and uh, see how we might be a part of your purpose, your plan, as your kingdom would come, as your will is done here upon this earth. So uh, bless our time together. Give us a good time of fellowship, encouragement, insight. Uh, help us to learn from one another, to grow, to be strengthened in our faith, and to be challenged in our response to your call upon our life. To serve together here at this university, at Hundum Global University, to your honor, uh, to your glory as we look to you, as we wait upon uh, the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And pray, come, come Lord Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You know. uh, thank you for your coming. If you have not signed up, please do so and take your hand up. Okay? Now, I want to invite you, Professor Nicholas Mantinga, and speak about Christian education. Thank you, John. It's a really honor to speak, and uh, thank you also for coming this evening. Um, this is a subject that uh, it's close to my heart, um, and um, I'll tell you a little bit about what I'm most interested in in terms of uh, the subjects that I like to teach, and so you get a, a sense of where I'm coming from, what I, what I do, what I like to teach and think about. Um, what I'd start off with is by, by tell, talking about the theme of secularism. Secularism, I'd say, is, is not my story. There's a book, a feminist, a woman writer in the United States who once wrote a book called Feminism is Not My Story, uh, and I'm taking off on that here. Uh, secularism is not my story. Although I grew up at a time, just soon after this was published, uh, I came into the world about the same time in the 60s, in which Time Magazine asked, is God dead? That's a sense of the kind of context into which um, many of us lived in the last century. Uh, in, I give you these next two pictures here so you can understand that the story here, this is the picture of the Berlin Wall. Right? So in the middle of Europe is Germany, and in the middle of Germany is the city of Berlin. And right down the middle of Berlin, the communists created a wall and divided east from west. And the story of the Berlin Wall falling in 1989 is a great story and it needs to be told. However, the way it has been told often in my discipline of international studies is that after God is dead, the Berlin Wall falls, the triumph of capitalism over the triumph of communism. And soon thereafter, this guy named Francis Fukuyama, one of the authors I like to read a lot of, regardless of what he says is right or wrong, it's always interesting, it seems to me, he wrote a book and said, we are now at the end of history. And, and what he meant was that all of us, by which he mean, meant secular, liberal, or in his case a bit of a Hegelian, all of us, we have come to the end of human development, and while there will be conflicts, say, between people who haven't arrived with us secular folks, in the most part, we won't have conflict between other people who have arrived, Europeans and Americans, and anybody else who's secular like us. This is essentially the same story that we heard from this fellow back in the 30s, A.J. Ayer, was a British philosopher, uh, in, uh, and he 
wrote a book called Language, Truth, and Logic, in which he said, all utterances about the nature of God are nonsensical. And he didn't mean that sort of tongue-in-cheek, like, oh, you guys are being silly. He mean not literally nonsensical. It would be as if you were reciting the poem called Jabberwocky, and that begins with the words, "'Twas brillig, and the swilly tobes did gyre and gimble in the wave, all mumsy were the borogroves, and the momraths outgrave." Those aren't English words, so don't feel like, I didn't understand it. You're not meant to understand it, right? It's impossible to understand. You're meant to feel it, but not to understand it. And that's what A.J. Ayer was saying about Christians who say, God lives. He says, you don't even have the right to be proven wrong. That's how foolish you are. And he didn't even think it was worth his time talking about. But that's not the whole story at all. That's certainly not the story of the Berlin Wall. Indeed, if you look at the destruction of the Berlin Wall, you recognize, if you know a little bit of history, that it's intimately connected, actually, with what went inside a church called, interestingly enough, St. Nicholas Church in Leipzig. Okay? And in Leipzig, they had been holding prayer meetings for the better part of six years to six years, they've been meeting every Monday and praying that peace would come, that the East German totalitarian state would fall, and that Germany would be reunited. They prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And the church pastor, Christian Führer, uh, he, he was instrumental in, in promoting that. And as a result, then, uh, the, the, this came as the result. But behind that, anybody know who this guy is? Lech Walesa, he's a Polish guy, the next country north of Germany. He was a head of a, a union, you can see it at the top, called. it's translated as Solidarity. And uh, Solidarity was a labor union. Now that seems unremarkable, but Poland, you might recall, was a communist country. If it's a communist country, you might wonder... What is a labor union doing? Because communism was supposed to be the regime for laborers. It was supposed to be a society that was built around labor's interest. But it turned out it wasn't so much so. It was pretty much an awful place for workers. So they organized a union. It's a really kind of a contradiction, right? That's a crazy thing to happen. Valesa. Now he was the inspiration to many of the people, especially the church leader here, that, that prayed in Leipzig, that provided the context and the inspiration for the fall of the wall. But you can see there's still one space left. Where did Valesa get his insight from? You can't answer this. Who is this guy? Pope. Pope John Paul II, sometimes called John Paul the Great. He was the first ever Polish bishop of the Catholic Church, the first non-Italian in 455 years mm -hmm. right, to be elected as Pope. He's an amazing guy, and, and, and you wonder, what does he have to do all with this Christian higher education thing? Well, here it is. John Paul II had been a philosophy professor. <clears throat> yes, a philosophy professor, right? <laughs> In the university, at the Catholic University of Lublin, right, as Archbishop of Krakow, he nurtured an intellectual community that provided resistance to all the other communist institutions, all the communist universities. His space provided an actual context for resistance. His philosophy, the things he articulated, closely connected his Christian faith with human dignity. And one of the fundamental things he found rooted in human dignity was our ability to come together in solidarity, in trust, and in love with each other. That's what inspired Lech Walesa. That's what inspired St. Nicholas. That's what inspired the protesters at Leipzig and beyond in Berlin to take down the wall. 
And they did it nonviolently. They did it. You, you ought to see some. You can still find the pictures on YouTube. I showed them to my children a few days ago. That's what we do to our kids, right? It's maybe not a case of child abuse, but. but we, I showed them to my young, my boys, and it is inspiring, right? The, the East German Stasi, which is the secret police, they beat on the protesters, trying to provoke them to respond, and they refused. Every time somebody picked up a rock, the protesters would encourage each other in solidarity by saying, no violence, no violence, because of course, what had happened, and maybe you don't know, what had happened just a couple months before the Leipzig protests and before the Berlin protests was the massacre in Tiananmen, where thousands were killed. Right? The East Germans had mobilized 15,000 troops. They were primed, they had fully automatic weapons, and they were ready to open fire. But they got intimidated because, through solidarity, the protesters were so impressive in their refusal to get sucked into that violence. It was a very impressive thing. Now, the rise of religion and telling the story of that is opposite of what, um, what these folks say, right? This would be Richard Dawkins and Chris Hitchens, right? Much reduced is this figure, right? Remember A.J. Ayer and his scorn. You Christians don't even deserved. But instead, we have guys who go on tour at Christian campuses. You can watch debates with Christopher Hitchens at Biola University. Right? They go to Christian campuses in order to say, really, really, you guys shouldn't have any place in Christian life and you shouldn't have universities and you're really dumb. But that's a different thing. It's a different attitude. They have to go out and try to tell people to not talk about religion. There's gone is the confidence of disdain, the confidence of scorn. Right? Instead, they, they have to get on the bully pulpit and, and go and, and try to preach their bad words to others. Now, my interest then is also not just in this discussion of secularism, what story are we a part of, but it's also where is that story taught? And that's why my interest is in John Paul II. Right? He's a scholar, a Christian, who inspired students and others beyond to uh, uh, Christian forms of political protest and response to injustice. And, and so I worked with this organization called the Yabshi, and that brought me, the Yabshi stands for, it's a long title, the International Association for the Promotion of Christian Higher Education. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 a sort of it's a purpose statement is its title. We can put it that way, right? So what we did is try to inform, equip, and connect Christian scholars, university professors around the world. And so I traveled actually here twice before I came to teach as a professor and gave lectures at the law school, right? So uh, on, 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 on various topics and and. In the process of doing that, I got to, to know all sorts of interesting folks. Okay? But I also, my third interest besides secularism and Christian higher education, as you can see my students here, these are the Quaker students, and I teach in the Graduate School of Development and Entrepreneurship here. And there, I am uh, constantly talking about the state, the rule of law, so the state, the rule of law, and civil society. Those are the fundamental categories that we talk about in human development. We want to talk about what is it like, what are the political structures necessary for human flourishing. That's the kind of questions we talk about. Those are the big three. Okay? Those are the ones that we talk most about. Okay, so I'm going to give you four arguments. That was a long introduction, I know. But I'm going to give you four arguments four theses that help combine my three interests. And you'll see my three kind of interests percolating up here. And these are the four. Right? That Christian higher education has grown dramatically. That Christian higher education's growth seems to predict dynamic Christian growth. That Christian higher education's growth occurs best when it's apart from state power. And that I think Christian higher education can provide a distinct form or distinct forms of human development, like
like I said, what does it mean to be truly, fully human? I think Christian higher education provides a powerful path towards national development. Okay? So those are the four things. And we'll see them, I'll flash those up as we go along, all right? So there's, here's my first argument. And this is pretty straightforward. We did a study of the growth of Christian higher education worldwide when I was at EOPS. You remember that institution with the big long name, right? So when, when I was there, we got uh, some money, some grant money from a place called Calvin College, and they let us study, and we found this pattern. The starting and sustaining of Christian universities over time. So this is a long graph. It comes from before 1600, so a, a few years ago. And you can see little bumps, little bumps growing over time. And then you have this huge spike that occurs right, right towards the end of World War II. <clears throat> huge spike. And then it comes down. And then you have another really big spike that comprises the last 25 to 30 years. Who's in this last spike? Yeah, look around. <laughs> You all are in this fight. We're in it together. That's this is where Hot Dog is born in these last 20 years, 25 years, right? So this comes out of um, what what had happened is is, is that in, in traveling and in working to connect and give seminars to Christian faculty, I kept running into people who would say, "Yeah, but did you hear there's this new university here? And what about there? there there's this, there's this new one starting here in northern China." And did you hear about this one that's maybe starting in Cambodia? And, oh, there's four of them started last year in Nigeria. Can you believe it? I thought, this is amazing. And I kept running into other people, like a guy named Joel Carpenter, a professor at Calvin, and he was interested, and he kept finding these same things. And another fellow that I knew from uh, graduate school, a guy named Perry Glanzer, he, read, he was saying the same thing, and we were in conversation, and it kept coming up, and I thought, we need to study this. And so we did. And we did a big survey for about three years. We spent surveying Christian colleges and universities, looking at their books, uh, their curriculum, looking at their mission statements, looking at the classes, how big they were, when they started. Most of it's web stuff, but some of it we had to get in, in, in documents. And some of it we did by uh, questionnaires. And this is and this is what we found. And I, I thought that was just fascinating. So the almost 21% of all existing Christian colleges, so one-fifth of all existing Christian colleges in the world were founded in the last 25 years. And remember, we, we've been at this as Christians. The first university actually started back around here, University of Bologna, in about 1300. 1,200, sorry. Depends on who you ask, but around 1,200. So we've been at this job for a long time. That's a long time. Yeah, it's a long time. <laughs> All right. All right, so here's my second thesis. Christian higher education's growth seems to predict Christian dynamism. By this, what I mean is that um, if you look at where Christian, Christian higher education begins to decline, or where it begins to increase, you'll notice a lag feature that soon thereafter, you begin to see a decline in actual numbers of Christians in a particular location. Okay? So also, when you see Christian colleges founded, you'll see an increase coming around. They're intimately connected. Now, I'm not always sure, it's not always clear whether it's a leading or a trailing function. Because in some places, it seems that Christian colleges come right after, their founding comes right after a great, great growth of Christian, higher, Christian population. Sometimes.